I'm Dr. Duke Majin, and we are here at the Duke Spine Institute Surgery Center of Yera, getting ready to do our third case of the day. Our patient is presents to us with back pain and pain down the leg on the left side. And you can see the MRI, and I'll try to do my best job of pointing. There we go, sorry. All right, here's the lumbar spine right here. And you can see normal looking disc right there. It's uh, white, another one that's white right there, another one that's white right there. These are all normal looking discs, but then you get to this disc here, the L45 and the L5S1. And those two discs are damaged. As a matter of fact, they have pretty good sized herniations coming out the back of them. So that will be our focus for the surgery is repairing those two discs from a left approach because our patient has left leg symptoms. So when the lumbar spine, I always go on the side that they have the leg symptoms. Sir, are you okay? All right, Dr. Duke Majin here. We're gonna get started, okay? I'm gonna have you awake for the first 10 minutes and then I'll put you to sleep, all right? So. First thing I have to do is I'm just going to push around your back with my hand and I'm feeling for your hip area to know where I need to go. I'm feeling for your ribs and right between them and your middle midline and I think we're about ready. I'm going to give you some numbing medicine, okay? All right, so you'll feel a little stick and burn. Don't be upset. It's normal. I know. I apologize. This is just numbing medicine. It'll make things feel better in a moment. Now, if you have pain, I want you to say, ouch, okay? okay. Don't move your body. Don't try to get off the table. That won't help anybody. But uh, if you feel some discomfort, just say, ouch. And I'll give you some more numbing medicine, okay? Deal? Deal. All right. All right, I'm giving you more numbing medicine. That's the actual numbing medicine going in right now as we're, as we're talking. All right, so he's, yeah, he needs something. <laughs> he's getting worked up already. Now, before I get started, you're going to need to be looking at that x-ray picture because it's, it's not good. What's wrong with it? I got to get you to see yourself what's wrong and fix it yourself. All right? Because it should already be fixed by now. So what's wrong? Do you see the iliac crest? They're way off. They should you should be going straight through them. Okay? So you got to wag until you get them lined up. Also the end plate of L5 at the bottom, the inferior end plate should be lined up. You got to take pictures. We can't do this by just imagining you got to take shots. I haven't seen a shot. Have you taken a shot? All right, that's a little bit of an improvement, but not much. I think your base needs to go south and my side needs to go north a little bit. Okay, if I had to guess. Just looking at the patient and the orient. No, your base south. Your base south. That's correct. And your wag north. All right, take the picture. Luis, any help you can give this young lady would be good. Go further north with my side. Shot. Further north means about three degrees of movement, okay? No more, no less. All right, so we got some weirdness on the lateral view. And the real question is, where is 5-1? Where is 5-1? All right, why don't you release my side? I think we overshot it. And shot. That's certainly better. That's almost perfect. Um, so I think you need to move the base north a little bit. We overshot south. Bring the base north. Good. That's it. Lock the base now. Don't move it. And then let's take a picture. You're pulsing, right? All right. You think my side south? My side south. Wag it. Shot. 
That's a little better. Still a lot of glare. So um, that's that's probably okay. All right, now we need to do a little orbiting. Your side down, about a degree. Shot. That's, let me see one more time. That's actually pretty good. That's pretty good. It's amazing though, huh? Like the iliac crests aren't lined up, but the pedicle of five is lined up nicely. That's good. Let's just lock everything in there. Um, I think we just got a little off with the wag in the beginning, which is why we're so far south with the base. I think your base may have been in good position, but the wag was off, okay? Sir, are you okay? Remember, let me know if you feel any pain, all right? A little bit of pain is okay, but if it gets really uncomfortable, just let me know. Deal? All right. Shot? Is that uncomfortable? Shot? All right, let me give you some numbing medicine. Try not to move, okay? I know it's hard, and if you move a little, it's fine. We'll, we'll accommodate it. But we'll just have to reposition the fluoro every time. It's not good for you, not good for us. Okay, I gave you some more numbing medicine. Ah, that looks pretty good. There's still an orbital issue. And I don't know which side. I think your side needs to go down a little bit. Let's try that and see what happens. You can sort of see a double shadow on the 5-1 facets. That's better. But then the sacrum has now changed. Let's go the opposite direction just for a second and see what happens. Shot? Hmm. Think worse, Luis? Yeah, go the other way, please. So our, a little more, our patient has a little bit of scoliosis. Uh, it's probably going to be as good as we're going to get it right there. Lock everything down. Our trajectory looks good. So we're not here to fix scoliosis, but we are here to fix his back pain and leg symptoms. Shot. So we're not doing a deformity surgery by any means. Oh, beautiful. I tell you, sometimes these things just guide themselves. Don't believe a word I say. You comfortable? Shot, AP. <laughs> it's better to be lucky than good, right? Isn't that what they say? I felt the facet. I just went right around it. He has no pain. Watch it, shot. Really nice, perfect. I love it. Go back to the, uh, you can see the scoliosis, by the way, on that AP view. Go ahead and go lateral, please. So the tip of our magical scepter, I hate to say needle, because it's gonna scare the patient, but the tip of our, our uh, huh? Pointer, there we go, pointer. I love it, pointer, thank you. Is, what's that, you like the magical scepter? <laughs> I figured you would, of course. All right, are you comfortable? Good, you're doing great, Shot. Everything's going well, no problems. All right, we're just having a little bit of fun because things are going well, and when things are going well in the operating room, you get to have fun. So let me take a moment to talk about online trolls. <laughs> I know Sean and Zach are cringing right now. <laughs> That's why it's so funny. But anyway, just understand everyone that this broadcast and everything said during the broadcast is really, it's uh, made available as a learning experience for you, the viewer and that it's uh, honestly free because I pay for it out of my pocket 
and I want the world to, to really see what it is that's being done and how good results can be. Are you okay? I didn't hear what he said. All right, you're doing great. We're almost done. We're going to put you to sleep in a minute. Long story short, when, you, uh, when you're the, huh? Yeah, let's do the other one. When you, when you uh, produce the show, you get to kind of uh, direct it and fill the content of the show. And I want to make it as, as interesting and educational yet fun of an experience as possible. So one of my viewers commented on my use of, um, as of food during one of the surgeries that I used. When I was talking about quality of medical care, I used an example of, of, of steak and different qualities of steak. So they were uh, struggling to understand why and I guess my explanation just went right over their head. But that said, this is more of a disclaimer about how I'm not going to make every one of you that watches the show happy. All right. But that's not why I'm here. I'm here to make my patient happy. And as long as I can make my patients happy, then I have done far more than any, any other spine surgeon in the world, to be honest with you. And I'm not bragging, I'm being truthful. We have a very high satisfaction rate amongst our patients that we treat because we provide excellent care and safe care. Duke Spine Institute rarely ever has a complication. And with the laser surgery, I've never had a complication. So we don't in expect to have any today. And I honestly, after doing 1,300 of these surgeries, of course, there's always a chance a complication can occur. And I can't predict when they will. They're unexpected. But um, that said, we, we have a pretty good track record since we've done over 1,300 of these surgeries without a complication. Sean? You tell me, Dr. Pettit, have you, you've been doing anesthesia for how many years? Bef Over 38,000 uh, 38, surgeries. Yes. You've done 38,000 anesthetic, yes. anesthetic cases. So, so surgeries. surgeries. You don't do anesthesia if you don't do surgery, right? Yeah, similar, yeah, similar OB. Am I correct in saying that? All right, so you've, you've provided anesthesia for over shot, over 38,000 surgeries. And have you ever seen a surgeon who's never had complications with their surgery? No. Ever. Have you ever heard of any surgeon that's never had a complication? Well, I have heard of any that have had You've heard of what? No, no, but have you, is it, you know enough to know that, have you ever had a complication in 38,000 anesthesia cases? All right. Sure. Yeah, but you're talking about trauma situations, right? I'm talking about elective, controlled, AP. But you know in the surgical world to have over a thousand surgeries of a type and never have a complication with that type, that's pretty unusual in spine surgery. Yes, it's, it's, it's unheard of. I've never heard of a spine surgeon that's had zero complications. Now, I've had complications certainly with fusions, but not with this Duke laser disc repair. That's really the point we're trying to make is you know, 1,300 endoscopic surgeries that I've done in 16 years and not a single complication. So that's a really good record of safety. And I'm not tooting my horn. So, so this comment that I just made, some people would, would misconstrue as I'm patting myself on the back. I'm not. What I'm patting on the back is the technique, the surgery, the safety of this surgery. If you adhere to the principles of the surgery, you know, with respect to the navigation and, and safety issues, 
then this surgery can be done as probably the safest spine surgery in the world, not having had any complications. As a surgeon, I've had complications, but not with this surgery, not with endoscopic surgery. Are you okay? Are you enjoying the conversation? All right, and you're not gonna like me very much. Have you watched my surgeries online? No? Did he say no? Have you watched the surgeries? No. Oh, he doesn't know what happens next. All right, fair enough. He knows, he said. How bad is that on a scale of 1 to 10? A what? <laughs> he said it too. He's got a sense of humor. Yeah, you almost came off, came off the bed. I was going to reach for a sterile saddle. Um, so that was your L45. Okay, so I'm going to draw I'm going to draw your L45. Nine over ten. Okay, so that was a nine out of ten. Is that where you typically get your back pain? Yes. All right. Well, great news. That's going to be gone for the rest of your life as long as you don't re-injure your back after the surgery is done. I'm just showing the audience where the tear is. That let the jelly seep out. That's what we're going to fix right there. Is a tear right there. Okay. And then I hate to say this, but you know what comes next, right? What do you say? One more. The L5S1. And we don't know how much pain that is yet, do we? So on the discogram, you can see all the dye that leaked out the back of the disc, and it's in the epidural space, okay? And the reason is he's got a huge tear in the back of his disc at L45, and that dye that I just injected leaked out, and behind the disc, it leaked into what's called the epidural space. That's where the nerves are. That's why people with disc problems get nerve problems down their legs because the nerve is right behind the disc. So we have a 9 out of 10 concordant at 4.5. How bad is that on a scale of 1 to 10? I can't hear him. 8? That's all? Just an 8? Yeah. All right. I got some great news for you. You get to go to sleep. And when you wake up, we'll be done. Any questions for me before you go nighty night? What? You're going to have sweet dreams. <laughs> All right. So the second disc that we tested with the discogram is an 8 out of 10. And by the way, the insurance companies and all the the people that have to pay for spine surgery, they're all trying to prevent patients from having these discograms. Why? Well, the same reason they're trying to prevent people from having colonoscopies or prostate exams or breast, um, breast exams because those tests end up showing problems that need treatment, whether it's, um, you know, cancer surgery or... Um, back surgery, the tests are necessary to make a diagnosis. The diagnosis is necessary to make a treatment that works. So the insurance companies don't want to pay for the tests. So I noticed, for example, that United Healthcare and Cigna and even Aetna have now made it so that discograms are not covered. Well, this is a discogram. This procedure I just did confirmed 100% that this patient's pain is coming from the tear in the L45 and L5S1 disc. So why is that important? It's important because if you let the insurance companies take away your right to have diagnostic medical tests done, then they're really taking away your, your rights and ability to have treatment. Treatment, life-saving treatment. And you know what? We can't let that happen, folks. How's he doing? Is he just, uh, huh? How you doing, buddy? No, it's okay. He's just bucking a little bit, but I don't know if he's. All right. 
but he's um, moving air good. Little jaw thrust. Is he okay? All right. So I'm going to go ahead and remove the needle and t leave the guide wire in place. So what I'm getting at, folks, if you're watching this program, is the insurance companies are doing their damn best to keep you from having a test that shows what's wrong with you so that they don't have to pay for your treatment. Now, some of you are going to be naysayers, haters for what I'm saying, but I understand that. You just can't accept the truth. I don't say this because I'm some idiot standing here in front of you. I say it because I see it every single day in the practice of medicine in the United States. And it doesn't just happen in the United States, it happens all over the world where insurance companies are denying payment for tests that will make the diagnosis as to what's wrong. Um, our patients, the discogram is part of the Duke Laser Disc Repair, and our patients want to know the truth. They don't want some insurance company that's going to tell them what the best care they can have for their bodies. They want the best care for themselves. They don't want an insurance company telling them what they can and can't have. Okay? That's no different than I have to be careful what I say. That's no different than uh, being exploited, all right? And exploitation of any people or any resource is not good for that person or resource. We can all think of times that people were exploited in the past based on physical attributes and these people with back pain and herniated discs are being exploited by their insurance companies not paying for their medical care or trying to get out of paying for it um, I'll tell you a story since I'm sure my comments are going to generate some backlash from certain people, but not that I care, but I'm trying to help them understand. How's he doing? Good. We're okay? So when I was a, a medical student at USC in Los Angeles, at USC Hospital, I spent my first summer in between year one and two doing research, shot. And the research area I had was in epilepsy I wanted to cure epilepsy. So I went to UC San Diego and I worked with a neurosurgeon who was a resident at the time doing research. His name was Lou Kornakia, Dr. Louis Kornakia. And he was studying epilepsy in rabbit brains by um, basically doing a craniotomy and inducing seizures and then using voltage sensitive dyes to study changes in voltage across the surface of the brain related to seizures. And then we would video those, those uh, seizure events. We would video the cortex using a special camera that looks at um, changes in dye color based on voltage. So you could follow the progression of the seizure across the cortex. Anyway, long story short, Dr. Kanaki, a great guy, now, the chairman at, of neurosurgery at UC San Diego, his name was Dr. Marshall at the time. And Dr. Marshall was a neurosurgeon. He did brain surgery, like myself and Dr. Kornakia, but at the time I was just a medical student. Dr. Marshall op also happened to be uh, a real a-hole, okay? A real Adam Henry, as the police say. And Dr. Marshall was not liked by anybody because he was a really mean SOB who didn't care about people very much. Sorry, Dr. Marshall, if you're listening. I doubt you are, but anyway, Dr. Marshall happened to be in charge of the insurance plan for 
the University of California, San Diego. And he was in charge of making determinations about whether the, the people who were on the plan and had the insurance would get medical care for given diagnoses. So as I was doing my research that summer with Dr. Kronakia, it there was like a disturbance among the neurosurgery residents. And Dr. Kronakia came to work one day, he was quite distraught. And I said, what's wrong? And he said, well, we just found out that one of the residents' wives was diagnosed with cancer. She was diagnosed with leukemia, leukemia. And I said, well, that's horrible. I'm sorry to hear that. And he goes, yeah, but what's worse is that there's only a 10% chance of survival with treatment, but a 0% chance of survival without treatment. And I said, my God, you know, so when is she going to get her treatment? And he said, that's just the problem. She's not going to get the treatment. Why? Because Dr. Marshall, who's in charge of determining who gets what treatments, decided that the chances were too low at 10%, that, that it would work at 10%, that he decided, and it's too expensive, that they decided not to give her treatment. My God, I mean, can you imagine, even if it's 10%, how could you say no to somebody's life? It takes a special kind of person to say no to life-saving treatment. And that's who works for the insurance companies, folks. You think I'm full of it? Just keep waiting. They just announced that a hospital in Los Angeles is closing after 74 years. There are announcements of hospital closures all across the country. Why? Because they're not making enough money because the insurance companies aren't paying them. It's that simple. Now, people will try to argue with me, but trust me, I simplify things as I talk about them, not because my understanding of them is simple, but because people need things to be simplified to understand the true impact of what I'm saying. That's what teachers do. We simplify things to certain levels. For people who understand the simpler levels, they can then have a more comprehensive understanding of what's really going on. But I've seen it over years now for the last 30 years. Insurance companies denying treatments, denying testing, denying medications that people need that are life-saving, life-changing treatments. And the discogram is just one of those examples. I've seen it go from being covered by all insurances to now being denied by large insurance companies like United Healthcare, Aetna, and Cigna. Now, why is that significant? Well, guess what? Medicare covers discograms. Medicare. Medicare is the most conservative of all the insurances. Why does Medicare see discograms as necessary, medically necessary, and yet the private insurance companies say it's not? They just haven't made that change yet. Trust me, within a few years, the private insurance companies that control Medicare they're called Medicare Administrating Companies, Max. They control Medicare throughout the United States. They're going to make discograms not necessary. Why? Because they don't want people getting a discogram because a discogram will result in surgery if it's positive and shows a painful disc. So beware, folks. Trust me, I won't be affected by these changes. You will. And so if you want to preserve your own health and preserve your access to the best medical care available in the world, you need to fight the insurance companies who are trying to take away your access to care. And they do it through so many different techniques. I have a list of them all in my mind and literally it's 300 different ways insurance companies prevent people from getting care. Things like co-pays, deductibles, co-insurance, limits, narrow networks. I mean, the list goes on and on and on and on. Appeals, denials, peer review. There's so many ways. You know, somebody was shocked the other day when I told them the original research that, that was um, 
done by Dr. Eugene Karaji out of Stanford that was trying to show that spine surgery didn't help people with back pain, which was all made up garbage, by the way, that Dr. Karaji published. That research was funded by Blue Cross Blue Shield, State Farm Insurance, United Healthcare. These insurance companies are funding doctors to publish papers that show that medical treatments don't work. And these doctors are like the trolls of surgery or medicine. They're the ones that just hate everybody and everything. They're the most negative people in the world. And they're literally being funded in secret to publish papers that say, you know, liver transplant doesn't work, for example. Uh, taking out a brain tumor that's gonna kill somebody doesn't work, so don't pay for it. And that's what's happening. It's been happening for 20 years. So I'm one person who's fighting this, but I can't do it alone. And I certainly won't do it for people that don't uh, appreciate it. So this is inside the disc and you can see there's, honestly, compare this one to the one earlier today that we did first. Incredible difference, right? There's a lot more soft, um, juicy, we call it hydrated disc material. Whereas with that first case we did, with the gentleman with L344551, he had that 4.5 and 3.4 disc that were severely degenerated and it doesn't, didn't look like this, did it? It looked a lot more scarred up. Now, both patients will have equally good results. And by the way, the first patient is already gone from the surgery center. He has no more pain in his back uh, that he came here with. He has no more pain in his legs. He said both legs are, are normal. He said the pain that I used to have in both legs is completely gone. His back pain he came here with completely gone. So he'll be back tomorrow morning to be checked on. And we'll do a quick video tomorrow in clinic. Sean, you'll be here, I assume? He will. All right. Thank you. And um, the second patient, the thoracic disc herniation, already gone. Uh, he's from California. He flew out here because he can't get the surgery done in California. And he's very happy. Um, his thoracic pain is gone. And we will uh, see how he's doing tomorrow. I expect him to be doing well. So both of the first two laser surgery patients are already gone. And right now I have, uh, this is our last case for the day, for April 1st, April Fool's Day on 2021 at Duke Spine Institute. We had three surgeries today. We had Nico's for lunch. <laughs> Did you get some of that? No? Luis, you're killing me. Don't do that. You get out there and have some of those tacos. You understand? You're making me feel like a bad boss. You know? Do I have to hold the surgery so you can go eat? I do, right? Just run out there and get something to eat. I don't know how you do it, Luis. Luis, uh, when I first met Luis, he was a little heavier and he's lost a lot of weight. And he looks like one of those guys in that Australian group, the thunder from down under. You know, those male strippers. Yeah, he's looking schvelt. He's making somebody happy, I know that, <laughs> right? Yes, All right, we're just about done with this disc and uh, we'll be moving on to the next disc next, of course, you like that? This is L5S1, by the way, and there's a little bit of fat there, no big deal. And you can see we're just at the end of the disc, of, at the end of the annulus here. The blue stuff, by the way, one of our um, viewers was commenting on the blue stuff. Yes, it's dye. 
It's a dye that I inject during the discogram. It helps me see the degenerated nucleus propulsus. It only stains degenerated nucleus propulsus. Doesn't stick to anything else. You can see it doesn't stick to the annulus. It doesn't stick to the posterior ligament. It doesn't stick to the bone. It doesn't stick to the fat. It only binds degenerated nucleus propulsus. And of course it's blue, like Duke Spine Institute's colors. We are royal blue. Does that surprise anyone? All right, gonna wrap it up. I'll take a look here, you can see some more fat. And then of course the nerve root, beautiful. Look at the nerve root right there. You all see that, check that out. Isn't that gorgeous? That's the dorsal root ganglion right there covered in dura with a little bit of cobwebs we're not going to zap it with a laser sorry i don't do those kind of requests but we want to protect it behind the retractor there's a little bit of i, I need to control the wire louise you're holding it Better? for some reason i can't twist it i can't get it where i want it to go okay, all right there we go that was more of a tube positioning. All done. We have See, a question. Yeah, we're just underneath the nerve root. That's the armpit or axilla of the nerve root, as we call it in neurosurgery. That's the uh, left L5 nerve root. And I will take the question. Uh, we have a viewer asking, uh, after the surgery is done, um, how much would I be able to lift without re-injuring myself? After the surgery is done, how much can I lift without re-injuring myself? The answer is, um, in the long term, after one year, you can lift whatever you want. Whatever you want, no restrictions. But you gotta wait 12 months. Yeah. So in the first 12 months, I don't like my patients lifting more than 40 pounds, 40 pounds. 40 pounds is the magic number. If you keep it under 40, you should be fine. All right, pressure. Go lateral, please. Yeah, we always start with the lateral. We finished fixing the L, you don't push on the midline, you wanna push on the muscle right there. We finished the fixing the L5S1 annular tear and disc herniation. Now we're gonna do L4-5. So, thank you, Luis. That's a great question about the lifting. The biggest risk of re-herniating your disc after this surgery is with lifting and bending at the waist. Either of those activities, lifting or bending at the waist. Bad. You want to avoid it for at least, you know, I prefer three to six months. What's going on, guys? Making sure what? You okay? Yeah, take your time. Whatever you need me to do, I'll do. Yep, no problem. Patient safety, number one, two, three. Can I proceed? Shot. All right, relax a little, Luis. You're yes, pushing sir. down too much. All right, very good. Okay, so this is the dilator for those of you who have never seen it up close and personal. It looks like a long metal pencil. It's got a hole at the end and that hole slides down the guide wire. It's a guide wire because it's guiding me and it's a wire. So it's a wire that guides. And okay, relax. No fanciness about its name, shot. It's the guide wire. All righty then. Passing through the muscle, sp spreading the muscle apart, shot. And now we're at the foramen, the back of the, the foramen, and now we're at the back of the disc. I can feel the disc with my tip, shot. That's the herniation, by the way, I'm feeling. And I'm ready to advance this metal dilator into the L45 disc through the annular tear. 
okay? So far, <clears throat> from the skin to where the tip is, we haven't done any damage except the skin, where we cut it. Aside from that cut, everything else is what's called dilated. Dilated is not the same as cutting. Dilating means spreading apart without cutting. Shot. And that's what's magical about this procedure as well, is that it's such a small path to get to the disc, such a skinny little path, that you don't actually cut things, you dilate them. You spread them apart. And the spreading apart is quite nice because it doesn't do any damage. Shot. And we don't want to do damage to this patient's body. That's the goal of surgery is to minimize damage from the surgery to the body. I want to damage a brain tumor as much as I can, right? If you're doing surgery for cancer, you want to damage the cancer, shot, but you don't want to damage the normal tissues of the patient, okay? Cancer is not normal tissues. Huh? So we're trying to fix this patient's bad disc without actually causing more damage to anything else like his muscles, his bones, shot. So it's important to respect the, the healthy tissues, shot. Yeah, that's good. And that's what we're doing. You understand? Protecting, respecting, loving, all the normal tissues. That's what minimally invasive surgery is all about. And endoscopic is the most minimally invasive of all surgery. True endoscopic. There's a lot of doctors that say they do endoscopic, but they don't. You understand? There's a lot of, a lot of surgeons that Honestly, they either intentionally or unintentionally misrepresent the truth about what they do. Is that a new one? No, no, it's not look, a new how, look how dark that is. That's beautiful. Why is it so dark? Huh? I don't know, sir. What'd you do? No, nothing. You've been painting it? Yeah, I've been sitting back there in the SPD painting? Yeah. Painting my tubes? Huh? All right. Sorry, Luis. No, I didn't mean to shine that in your eye like that or yours, or anybody's for that matter. All righty. All right, here we go. Down the rabbit's hole. So we're going down through the tube and filling it with irrigation. And uh, there we are, inside the herniation, inside the disc. You can see the patient's breathing. It opens and closes. That's not the disc breathing, though I'm sure some of my viewers might think that. That's the patient's valsalva. Valsalva comes from abdominal contractions. The abdominal muscles and diaphragm create the valsalva movements associated with breathing or retching. And you can see that transmitted, right? to the disc. You can see how the disc gets pressurized with certain movements and depressurized with others. So when you have a tear in the disc and then it, the disc pressurizes, whether it's a cough or a sneeze or even carrying something heavy, you actually push the jelly out through the tear. That's the problem, folks. Oh, that's a nice disc herniation right there. I want to get it and pull it out. It's not coming easily. Any questions, Sean? Sean? Not yet. Why, Sean, your voice has changed. 
Ever since Zach got here, Sean, your voice has changed. What Is can I say? Huh? What can I say? I'm growing up. <laughs> All right. Fair enough. Fair enough. Hey, Sean, I was thinking someday it'd be nice to try a broadcast where maybe you do the talking and I just operate. What do you think about that? I don't know if I'm qualified to do spine surgery. I didn't say you do the surgery. I said you do the talking and I do the surgery. Ah, uh, okay. All right, so for example, you know how you watch like football? You got the commentators and they have a nice voices and they're so nice to everybody. They're not offensive like I am. And that way I can just operate and we'll turn off my mic, <laughs> except when you want it on. <laughs> and I can talk about I steak. I think we should uh, consider putting a mic on Luis. You can put a mic on Luis, but he's pretty quiet. You I'm saying everyone? as a narrator, he, he'd be a good narrator. I see. Yeah, he probably would. Oh, I love it. We could do a Spanish broadcast. That's a great idea, guys. Luis? I agree. All right. Guys, start thinking about it. How we can incorporate it. Great idea. Yeah, it's not a bad idea. Put a mic on Luis too. But wait. I thought we talked about this already. We can't have, or is that just video feeds? We can't have two video feeds out of the OR without changing something, without running another line. It's both mics and video feeds. Mic we need extra video. hardware. Okay. Got it. Mm, you're right, Luis. Let Luis have the mic. Stand by. Let's try it. I'm all about trying new stuff. I wish. This will be our last disc repair for the day. So once we're done here, we will be done. So if you have questions, this is the time to ask them. Once again, oh, that's a nice little piece of herniation. Another one. Once again, folks, um, this is Duke Spine Institute. We're located in Orlando, near Orlando, Florida, about 40 minutes from the airport. So if you want to fly in and get your back fixed or neck fixed, come on down. It's a three-day program, and you can bring your family. Let the kids go to Universal Studios and Disney. And uh, while they're enjoying themselves at the theme park, you can get your back, neck, thoracic fixed, anything to do with the spine within reason we can take care of it here outpatient for you all right was that an advertisement i think so so i'm sorry but i did run an advertisement there for disney <laughs> honestly i think that's one of the nice things about this program is how close it is to orlando and the amenities in orlando you know, who doesn't love Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck and Pluto? What? <laughs> you hate them? You don't like crowds. Wait, 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 wait. Where did you Where did you go to high school? Okay, so not here. That's pretty crowded. In Disneyland, yeah. yeah. You said a couple of times. Why did you keep going back if you don't like it? Well, because my nephew was so generous of you. Yeah. 
What a sacrifice you've made for your nephews. So have you been out here to Disney? Oh, the Space Center. Nice. All right. Well, it does get crowded. But if it ever gets really crowded and it's bothering you, there's always a magic word you could say that would make it uncrowded very quick. <laughs> it starts with a B. And, uh, or nowadays you could say COVID yeah. and start running. <laughs> and things will clear out very quick. But honestly, uh, we went once during the COVID thing. And of course, it still is the COVID thing, obviously. But we went once, and it was like just empty. And it was really nice because you could get on all the rides without waiting in line. We have a question. The nighttime was that Universal or, or Disney? Harry Potter. Yeah, that Harry Potter ride is pretty popular. Okay, Zach. We'll take the question. Uh, we have a viewer asking, uh, what is the white stuff that you are zapping with the laser? Oh, right here, right now, that's scar tissue from inflammation. And I'm trying to release the herniation, but that's pretty much it. This is the annular debridement that we always talk about doing. So torn annular fibers right over there. And this is just a big wad of herniation just stuck in there. So I'm trying to release it by Breaking it apart with a laser, basically. Imagine like a big rock in the ground you're trying to get out, so you kind of dig the mud around it until you can actually free up the rock enough to pull it out. That's kind of what I'm doing. There's another piece, a herniation right there. So this is all fragments of disc herniation. They're basically little pieces of nucleus propulsus that have squeezed out through the tear in the annulus fibrosis and are causing, standby, are causing problems like pain in the back and legs. It'll take a long time to sit there and try to hack that piece out. So I try to take out some of the bigger chunks once I've released them. For those of you who don't know what that metal thing is there going in, that's called the pituitary rongeur. And it opens and closes like that so I can grab things, laser. What I'm grabbing are chunks of herniation. What typically happens is the herniation chunk um, gets the inflammation going so bad in the surrounding annulus that it gets scarred to the annulus, and then I'm in here trying to get it out. And I gotta just basically zap the attachments of the herniation to the annulus so I can get rid of the chunks. People wonder about that. They all think herniations come out in one big chunk, but it doesn't. Herniated discs actually occur in, uh, as episodes, episodically. So sometimes you get a giant herniation that comes out at once, but most of the time herniations come out in little stages, like little fragments, about, about the size of a pea. So you get one pea-sized fragment coming out when you twist to the right, and then uh, a week later you play some basketball with your friend and you squeeze out another pea-sized herniation. And so by the time I get in there and see all these little fragments, you know, I'm taking them all out in pieces. Again, that was a, my essentially my discovery of that because people don't really talk about it or know about it, but it's a, it's a, um, a multi-episodic event to have a herniation. It's usually not just one and done. People get a herniation and then they feel better after a few days as it heals partially, and then they get a second one, and then a third, and then a fourth, and. Some people end up herniating all their fragments, all their nucleus out 
over their lifetime and there's really nothing left in the disk. Whew. So that's, that's what we're dealing with is multiple events with multiple fragments. And they're all, they all get star scarred in. Every fragment that comes out sets up a new round of inflammation, you know? A new round of pain and suffering for the patient until it just gets so bad they can't take it anymore and they come and get it fixed. We have another question. Yep. Uh, we have a viewer asking, uh, how would you treat an SI joint? Can't walk without screaming in pain. Shots haven't wor helped. Great question. So somebody is asking about a sacroiliac joint. The sacroiliac joint is down by just to the side of the butt crack, in case you're wondering. And it's where the tailbone connects to the hip bone. There's a right SI joint and a left SI joint. And it, they're very common for people to get inflammation in those joints from arthritis. So you get a damage to the joint from some trauma and then the damage affects the cartilage in the joint surface and that cartilage gets destroyed over time. And then you get bone, um, basically inflammation within the joint. So the initial treatment is to do a shot in the joint and the shot is both diagnostic you know and therapeutic you need to make the diagnosis you need to know that that's really what's going on so we always give our patients that we suspect have an si joint problem with a diagnostic block we put in lidocaine and marcaine into the joint with a, a needle and an x-ray machine and then we kind of wait and see for a few minutes whether it takes their pain away and if it does well, then we know that their pain was coming from the SI joint. So this person's asking a great question, but my question to them would be, did the shot help at all, even for a few hours? And if the answer is no, it never helps at all, then you don't have SI joint pain. Your pain's coming from something else. The, ol the only way to make the diagnosis of SI joint pain is to do a shot in the SI joint and then see that that shot takes your pain away temporarily. So here's the problem. Number one, many doctors that try to do SI joint injections, they don't do the technique right and they miss the joint. So the medicine never makes it into the joint. So you wanna get what's called an arthrogram done where you can actually add some dye to the injection and you can see that the surgeon or the doctor was inside the joint when they injected the medicine. All right, it's called an arthrogram and you should see the whole SI joint, a dark line, just like the discogram we just did. You'll see, instead of a discogram, you'll get an arthrogram. Arthra means joint, arthrogram. So if there's an arthrogram done at the time you got your injection, and the arthrogram shows that the SI joint was indeed injected properly, and you didn't get any relief, then you don't have sacroiliitis. You don't have a sacroiliac joint problem. But let's assume for a moment you do, um, and that the SI joint is indeed the cause of your pain. The next step that I would recommend would be something called PRP and stem cell. It's not done everywhere. It's only done in a few places. Duke Spine Institute does it. If you do the uh, PRP and stem cell, it has about a 60% chance of working and giving you long-term relief. On the other hand, if it doesn't work, the next step after that would be a sacroiliac joint rhizotomy where we would go in and we'd kill the pain nerves to the joint using a needle and anesthesia. You know, put you to sleep while we do it. And then if that doesn't work for some reason, the last resort would be a fusion of the SI joint. And we do SI joint fusions at Duke Spine. And uh, that would be your last resort. So, you don't start with surgery of the SI joint. You certainly don't. You start with uh, more conservative treatment, including shots and PRP and stem cells. This is all herniation, by the way. As you see, once I attack it with a laser, it's just blistering out fragments of the herniation just stuck down. And I'm sitting here trying to release them. 
when I release them, they float up and out. This is herniation right here. Great questions, by the way, today. We've had wonderful questions from the audience. I really appreciate everyone asking questions. Once again, um, if you are interested in learning more, even when we're not in the operating room, we have a Facebook support group called Spine Surgery Support Group where we answer questions for anyone who asks them. It's free and open to, the, to everybody, but you just have to apply, obviously. That way we can kick out the trolls if we need to. Second of all, we have our own app at Duke Spine called the Duke Spine Institute app. And that's available free to download from your iPhone or Android platform. Using our app, you can actually ask us questions, interact with our team, do MRI uploads so we can review your MRI. And there's a lot of, um, there's a library of information in there for you to learn with. This is the end of the tear right here. I got five minutes or less. You can see the epidural space right there at 12 o'clock. There's a lot of scar tissue right here. You see all this? This was the disc trying to heal itself, but it just couldn't. It was unsuccessful. And as a result, the patient was always in pain in his back and leg. So I think our three patients today that we did laser surgery on, all three of them are gonna have 100% elimination of their pain they came to us with. Um, the second patient that we did the thoracic on, he wasn't so much a pain patient as he was a spinal cord getting crushed by a herniated disc patient. And I believe that's gonna be taken care of now. He still has a lumbar disc herniation, which we didn't fix. And hopefully he'll come back and get it fixed in the future if he needs to, which I think he does. Uh, we've talked about that. Um, and then finally, the, this patient and the other lumbar, I think, are going to be very happy with the amount of back pain relief they get and leg symptom relief they get. So we're going to check on them tomorrow. So if you check back at Spine Surgery Support Group or Duke Spine Institute, you'll be able to see those patients post-op one day and how they're doing. And I think they're going to be doing really well, both of them. This one and the first one for the day. I expect their pain to be gone. So this is really the only surgery in the world that cures back pain besides a spinal fusion done properly. And why would you have a fusion when you can have this surgery instead? Uh, one minute left, I think. Just about done. I'll come and do the Q&A real quick and then talk to them. They can wait. Okay. 30 seconds. I'm going to show you the nerve root again. This is so scarred up from all the inflammation. Nerve root should be right there, and it is, with a little vein on top of it. I think we're good, folks. Done. All right, if you have any questions, feel free to type them up. I'll be happy to answer them for you. Scope off. If you wanna look at the surgical incision, I'll show it to you right now you see the tube coming out just putting some pressure to keep it from bleeding 
not that it will bleed, but I don't want it to bleed if it is going to bleed. So it's minimal. We're gonna put pressure for about four minutes just to make sure any venous bleeding is done. Take a look here. There's the whole incision. So two uh, discs repaired with the Duke Laser Disc Repair here at Duke Spine Institute to cure his back and leg pain. I have a ray tech off the field and um, all done with a seven millimeter incision. No hospitalization. This is outpatient surgery. You go home an hour after your surgery. All right, type up your questions, please. I'll call the EBL uh, one mil again. If you have questions, type them up for me, folks. I'll be happy to answer them for you. Great job, everyone. Everyone, Dr. Duke will be joining us shortly for the post-op Q&A. Go ahead and post your questions in the chat now. All right, Dr. Duke Majin here. We just finished up a Duke laser disc repair, L3, sorry, L4-5 and L5-S1. And uh, just to show you what we did today, in this case, this patient had a herniated disc at two discs, L4-5, L5-S1. And the herniation is best represented on this plastic model by, I'm gonna look to the side, that red thing right there, okay? And the nerve is this thing right here, and that's what we looked at after we did the disc, disc repair. We turned the tube and I pulled it back and you can see the nerve right there, so it's pretty cool. But there's the herniation, that's what we got rid of. We cleaned up the tear where it came out of so that it'll heal properly. And of course, I came at it this way, underneath the nerve root, through the foramen. It's called transforaminal. The surgery went perfect. We lost about a few drops of blood and um, be happy to take your questions at this point. The patient will go home in about 45 minutes from now. It's pretty typical. It, the whole surgery was done with a little cut that big on his back. So we did uh, two discs, two herniated discs today with that little incision. And then the first case we did three. You have any questions? Any comments that I need to respond to? <laughs> They're all positive. <laughs> All positive comments, okay. Well, <laughs> for those of you who don't understand my sense of humor, I'm sorry. I'll try to work on making it better. And for those of you who do understand my sense of humor, I'm take my hat off to you and you see I do have hair. <laughs> have a great night. See you next week.